Yeah. Okay. Well, um, hello, everyone. And um, thank you to all participants for um, for joining. We are all sitting in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, it's uh, the weather is not too exciting, but um, it's not raining at least. So that is uh, that's always pleasant. So I'm Christine van Rombeek, and I'm professor of Persian literature and culture at Fames uh, in Cambridge. Um, and so just to give you a little bit uh, of a uh, background to this workshop, um, uh, I was approached by the head of our School uh, of Arts and Humanities, uh, Chris Young, Professor Chris Young, um, who suggested I organize an event this year for the school's Global Humanities Initiative. And so I immediately thought um, it would be so interesting to give a voice to the international visitors who come to Cambridge every year whether they come in order to work with specific members of our faculties, or whether they come to use the Cambridge collections for their research, or whether they hope to build connections with Cambridge and with the world beyond. And so that is the idea behind this workshop. Um, and I do hope, I do hope that the workshop is going to be the first of a series of such events all through, through the next years. Um, because I think these, such uh, meetings will encourage more visitors exchange within the higher education institutions that are part of the Global Humanities Initiative. And I'm, I, I think that, that people will really um, realize that it's thanks, very often thanks to these micro one-to-one -one collaborations that much larger international projects can develop. So we are really showcasing what, uh, what our collaborations can, uh, can achieve. So our panel this afternoon is as interesting and diverse as we can wish. Um, our four visitors who are here come from very diverse geographical, cultural and research horizons. Um, and I've also I also thought that it it would be uh, enriching to have to invite the Cambridge contact persons uh, to join their visitors in order to share their enthusiasm, in order to explain the synergies and the mutual benefits for host and visitor represented in these collaborations. So our first our our, our first speakers who are starting the workshop are Professor Frisbee Sheffield from uh, the Cambridge Faculty of Classics and visiting fellow Dr. Stephen Opompepra from Ghana. Next, we have um, the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies represented by Professor Paul Anderson and visiting fellow at the Center of Islamic Studies at FAMES, Professor Egdunas Rasius from Lithuania. Next, we have Professor Oksana Starshova from Ukraine um, Professor Starshova has a CARA fellowship at the Faculty of English at Cambridge. She is on her own because her mentor in the Faculty of English could not uh, join being abroad, but I see that the, the head of the faculty, Professor Line, is online and with us. And uh, thank you for being there, Raphael. Um, so um, representing the, uh, the Faculty uh, um, of English. So, um, our workshop then will end with another Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies collaboration between Professor Vergiani, who is in the middle of moving houses and who will join us very, very uh, uh, soon, and his research associate, Dr. Vinoth Murali from India, who is with us. So, um, I will each time provide a brief introduction for each of the uh, pair of speakers. But first, I'm very happy to give the floor to Professor Hans van der Ven, Professor of Modern Chinese History at FAMES, at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. Um, and Professor van der Ven is one of the founding fathers of the Global Humanities Initiative at Cambridge, under whose umbrella the workshop is happening. Um, Hans, you very kindly accepted to very briefly introduce uh, the workshop with a brief explanation of the vision that is encapsulated in our Global Humanities Initiative. And a, a word of warning, as the convener of the workshop, I have to scrupulously 
stick to the timetable. <laughs> and I apologize in advance, but I will have to interrupt if any of you tries to invade into the colleagues' slots. Um, and also, if you are an auditor and not speaking at the time, can you please mute your microphones? Um, there's an opportunity to ask questions to our speakers uh, through the chat button at the bottom of the uh, of the Zoom um, screen. Time permitting, we will also be able to uh, look at a few of these questions um, at the end of each of the paired presentations. Uh, but you can also, if you wish, address directly uh, the speakers for a one-to-one -one written exchange, if you prefer. So, Hans, over to you please, within 15 minutes. Oh, oh, I'll be shorter than that. Uh, Christine, thank yes. you very much indeed. First of all, for pronouncing my name in the right way. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often around Cambridge, uh, unfortunately. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a companion. I'm a Flemish, Flemish uh, mother tongue and, and you're, you're a Dutch mother tongue, so. That's right, exactly. Um, I, I, I'm going to approach this a little bit as, as uh, from sort of my own cultural background, meaning my own background as a scholar of China, where um, you know events like this begin with rather ritual performances by uh, people who are supposed to be in charge, and then they go away, and the real discussion happens. So um, in China, there are these things, these sort of these ritual announcements of the of, of a conference. That, that kind of ritual takes a long time. I want to keep it very short. Um, I, I first of all, I want to thank Christine for organizing this. I think she's absolutely right in um, giving a prominent place to our visiting scholars um, who so often come and are seen as guests rather than as real colleagues, uh, which I don't think is a good thing at all. And they, they really are very much an important part of what we do uh, and uh, are helpful to us in developing our own thoughts and hopefully uh, the same is true the other way around as well. Um, just to say something about global humanities, uh, for those that don't know, it is a partnership that involves two universities in China, that's Nanjing University, funnily enough in Nanjing, Fudan University in Shanghai, Ashoka University in India, where I spent some time uh, and in the Middle East, we work together with the American University of Beirut, as well as with Sabanki University in uh, Turkey. In South America, we work with Universidad Diego Portales. Uh, they're the guys who are responsible for running our website uh, and many, many, many other things. Our aim, as Christine said, is to forge new relationships. Um, between Cambridge and these areas, of course, but also between these areas uh, and each other. I think it's unfortunately still true that, for instance, scholars at Ashoka will talk to scholars in America, preferably, I think, for them, uh, but also in Europe, or that scholars in the Middle East, they too will be oriented towards Europe and America, but not to India or Indonesia or to China and so on. And the same is true from scholars in Africa. We're build, beginning to build a relationship with, with Svato Zones uh, in uh, South Africa as well. So we're trying to forge those kinds of connections as well. Um, and we do that through a number of activities. One is staff mobility. So we already have had scholars from AUB, from Ashoka, from China coming to Cambridge. Uh, the reverse flow also is, is established now. Um, we were afraid during the pandemic, and, you know, we were beginning to get calls for these, that the uptake was going to be uh, limited, but actually it's, it's very large, it's very enthusiastic, so it's a very good thing. So I think staff mobility is very important, staff mobility not just to get people to talk with each other in a coffee shop, but to teach together, for instance, uh, in the classroom. I think that's absolutely essential. Um, uh, for our own work, um, but and of course also to do research together and to bring to bring to to begin to break down those silos that are in every university and they need breaking down so badly. We also have high level events in Cambridge and elsewhere. At Cambridge, we've had Pankaj Mishra, 
we've had Ai Weiwei, which uh, was a great success, of course. In next September, we go over next fall, we're going to have Tristan Hunt, who is the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And so he's going to be with us at that point. And then we have lots of local forums that the various universities, partner universities, are uh, organizing. It's actually too much to, we can't possibly attend all of them. Uh, we've had ones on Nietzsche in uh, Perspective and Liberation in, in, in uh, Diego Patales. We have a long a series of events relating to republicanism. Uh, as Turkey is, of course, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the establishment. And again, to bring people from China, from India, from South America, from Africa, not just from Europe, you know, to begin to talk about republicanism, its history, etc., in a place like Turkey. I think that's just really, really exciting. Um, Digger Patalis is going to do something in the fall with uh, racial capitalism. Uh, we're doing work with microecologies between Cambridge and Ashoka. This summer, we very possibly are going to have a traditional Chinese opera performance at King's College. So again, it's, uh, if you don't know Chinese opera, I, I, there's nobody from China here, so I can say this. You're not going to be used to this kind of music. It's, it's, uh, it takes some getting used to. But again, that's, that's how you break things up. And, these, and some of these groups actually have worked with the Royal Shakespeare Company, so it's mutual influence already, and that, that's what we're trying to enhance. Uh, we're beginning to do the, the various collections that these universities are beginning to work together as well, uh, which I think would be very exciting, uh, especially because university collections are now, of course, subject to all kinds of political discussions, as they should be, uh, but that will make collections even more important, even more exciting. Um, we're also building reading groups around, you know, from the bottom up very much for people at these various partner universities who want to work together, read together, discuss together, a confined topic um, such as art and politics, which is run out of Ashoka. Uh, I will do something on the Second World War, which is my own topic. One of the things I'll be doing is to bring scholars from India, Indonesia, the Netherlands, and China together to talk about an Asian perspective on the Second World War. Um, I'm really excited about that. So lots of activities is happening, much more is going on. Lots of new initiatives are now being developed. It can't, you know, we have some very exciting news this morning, uh, but that will, um, I can't officially announce anything yet, but I think that's going to be a very good thing. Uh, so lots of excitement. Uh, and for me, global humanities, is about a couple of things. It is, of course, asserting the importance of the humanities in the times that we live. You know, if you look at the response to COVID, it was all about science officially. But of course, in reality, in, during the pandemic, what people really wanted to do was to, to read, to watch, to talk, to think, to contemplate. And the humanities delivers that. I don't think without the humanities, Netflix would not exist. Uh, so that is, that is worth doing. I think we also live in dystopian, polarized times. Uh, and I think the humanities is a way of thinking that through, of making that more relative. There have been lots of dystopian times in the past. So how have people dealt with these dystopian times? I think is a very good question. And how do we articulate a more positive, enthusiastic view of the future through the humanities and begin to sort of break open the stultified debates as, as I think they are right now? I think, and you know, it's, it's an issue that I've just been thinking about, but with AI, with social media, especially with chat GTP, you know, the sources of sound knowledge are increasingly localized, disenfranchised, relativized, chaotic. And I think in that kind of, you know, if, if knowledge becomes sort of a Wild West operation, which it seems to be, the humanities, the, the, the thinking on the basis of long histories, of long thought, on the basis of our collections, actually gains an enormous importance, uh, which is what I think we, we should be doing. For me, the ultimate aim really is to change the way that we teach and um, offer knowledge about our subjects at all levels. 
And this is a local parochial issue, but I think um, our own undergraduate education misses a lot because it doesn't really engage yet outside of Thames. Uh, and it's you know it's too black and white, but uh, it doesn't 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 engage enough with scholarships or traditions of scholarship traditions of humanities in all these areas which we are now trying to engage. And I think our students want it. They they are they're hungry for a more globalized way of going about their disciplines and their knowledges. Uh, that's my ambition. Um, given that uh, I'm in a very happy situation that I will. Well, it depends on how various votes in the future will go. Um, that I will have to retire from Cambridge uh, in two years' time. So, whether or not my vision will deliver it will not be my responsibility, but the responsibility of those who stay. I probably should stay. I should just be transparent about this. I worked for eight months of the year here in Cambridge and for four months of the year in China at Peking University, which is one of the ways in which staff mobility works. Uh, but that is all too rare. Uh, but so that's 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 sort of the kind of vision that we are after uh, and that we're trying to develop. And uh, with that, Christine, back to you. Thank you very much, Hans. That's a, that's a uh, um, a really in in depth um, assessment of 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 what uh, global humanities uh, uh, should become and have at at the core. And in their hearts, and so you know, let's uh, let's try and um, and work towards that that goal, which um, which might also save humanities, you know, in our in our Western Western world. So I think um, it's um, it's a big. Uh, can I, can yeah. I just make, I want to have a little footnote there. So one of the things I learned in Beijing when I was there in the last fall, which so completely surprised me, is that the humanities are thriving. They are hugely popular. So this is because a generation of people have become rich. That that generation of people had to make money. So they became engineers, they became lawyers, they became medics, and so on. And now when they talk to their children who are now going to university, and these children say, actually, mom and dad, I want to study history, they say, okay, fine, off you go. And so our enrollment in my department in uh, at Beida, at Ping University, is, is increasing very rapidly. Western classics are hugely popular across China. So there's a whole lot of stuff there uh, that we can engage with. So I think it's very exciting. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And we're all, that, that gives us hope. That gives yes, us it does. Yes. over here as well. Okay. Uh, well, you know, so we can um, move into the uh, workshop proper now um and our first pair of speakers is um a professor frisbee sheffield uh and stephen pepra um professor sheffield is associate professor in classics and works on ancient greek philosophy particularly ethics moral psychology aesthetics and she also looks at the reception of this knowledge and, and that's really interesting for me, focuses on the works of Hannah Arendt. Um, and, and in my, in my uh, field of classical Persian literature, I'm also looking at Hannah Arendt uh, because they're, they're, yeah, there are they're similarities. We'll be, we'll be in touch to talk about that frisbee if you, if you uh, would like that. And so with um, Professor Sheffield, we will hear Dr. Stephen Opong Pepra from Ghana. Um, he received his PhD at the University of Prade Karlov in the Czech Republic. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry about my pronunciation. Um, and he's currently a British Academy Fellow uh, involved in the ongoing collaboration between Cam the Cambridge Faculty of Classics and the classicist at the University of Ghana. And Dr. Pepra, your research focuses on Plato's politics, epistemology, and metaphysics and their interconnectedness. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to start by talking about the nature of this collaboration um, before giving the uh, floor to, to Stephen. So the Faculty of Classics has established a collaboration with classicists at the University of Ghana 
there's already a strong and long-standing relationship between the University of Cambridge and the University of Ghana, primarily, though not exclusively, through the Cambridge Africa program, but humanities subjects are currently underrepresented in these projects, and so this project is attempting to fill that gap. So, so far, we've fostered a research community between ourselves and classicists in Ghana, established online teaching provision in Greek and Latin to support their efforts to strengthen classics, and investigated mechanisms for widening participation for African students. So we noted that language was a particular um, issue, which is why we focused initially some of our efforts there. We've already learned much from their readings of ancient Greek and Roman classics, a discipline which became an explicit object of interrogation in post-colonial Ghana. And we have also funded a postdoc, the wonderful Stephen Pepra, who has just recently secured a British Academy Fellowship and from whom you will hear more shortly. So this project is a vital part of our continued efforts to keep the study of classics both inclusive and relevant in our interdependent global world, because classics is not just the study of the past, but the study of the possibilities of classical knowledge in the modern world. And the modern world is a global international world. So we need a vision of the future of classics that is fitted for that. And forging collaborative links with universities across the world, such as the University of Ghana, can help to, sh help to shape that vision of what it means to do classics today. Though classics is sometimes narrowly conceived as a Western European subject, there have been calls for a new narrative that is not focused around an outdated view of Western Europe's self-positioning as the center of the world, or one which bolsters an exclusionary history of the subject. Greater dialogue with universities across the globe is a crucial part of ensuring a more inclusive vision of the discipline, as well as its continued vibrancy. So our collaboration so far has not only opened up new lines of inquiry, but it has also been an exercise in humility. And these two things for me are very much related. So the project has provided an opportunity to consider more consciously the social and historical embeddedness of some of my own work and help to loosen the grip of some dominant readings of Greek thinkers by exposing the parochialism and historical contingency of standard lines of inquiry. So to give an example that, it's at the, that is at the heart of this project, consider Plato's Republic, which is one of the seminal works in the field of classics, and its reach in the humanities more broadly can be seen in the fields of divinity, English, and philosophy, to name but a few. Now, it's been difficult for scholars and students anywhere across Europe to read this work without reference to Karl Popper's uh, book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, whose first volume was called The Spell of Plato. This cast Plato as a proto-totalitarian thinker in the aftermath of the Second World War. And scholarship on Plato's politics has struggled to free itself from a set of questions that this book generated focused on individual autonomy and freedom. Professor Acker in Ghana, one of Stephen's teachers and a key part of this collaboration, argues that our current project, and I quote, enables an opportunity to reflect on alternative perspectives to Western readings of Plato's political philosophy, which depend largely on the uncontested assumption that individual liberties constitute the highest political value and that institutions and practices are to be judged by their success in promoting or achieving them. The assumption to which Acker refers has shaped our reading in a variety of ways. And even if we want to maintain it, it can be more vitally held if we interrogate it through engaging with the work of scholars who have not been reading Plato under the auspices of Popper. Some of the scholars from Ghana that we are collaborating with are drawing on a rich tradition of communitarian philosophy, where relations between the individual and the community are very differently conceived. This is already fostering new approaches to the value and nature of community in Plato. 
So I hope that this collaboration will encourage greater humility about our own readings and, as a result, openness to such new perspectives. And the second reason why we have chosen to focus the collaboration on Plato's Republic is that Professor Acker argues that Plato is, and I quote, especially relevant to thinking about community building and problems in leadership that face Ghana today. This line of this approach is also taken up by Kwame Gieke in his inaugural lecture at the University of Ghana in 1987, entitled with reference to Socrates, The Unexamined Life, Philosophy and the African Experience. Indeed, the Republic is widely read by philosophers in Ghana as an example of practice relevant thinking. Though it is admitted that Plato's philosophy was often metaphysical, its ultimate aim, it has been argued, was towards action and practical affairs, and nowhere is this clearer than in the so-called return to the cave at the heart of Plato's Republic. Now, the point of this example is that classics is being read in Ghana as a subject which is relevant to modern issues and concerns. The first president of Ghana, Nkrumah, who wrote Conscientiism, Ideology and Philosophy for Decolonization, made this approach explicit. He argued that much academic treatment in the universities he was exposed to in the UK and the US treat philosophical systems as though there were nothing to them but statements standing in logical relation to one another. And I quote, philosophy becomes so abstract in certain Western universities as to bring its practitioners under the suspicion of being taxidermists of concepts. So Nkrumah aims to restore what he calls the dynamism and polemical reference of these texts so that they can be used as a tool for cultural development in Ghana. The motivation for this approach was that for classics to justify its place in a university education in post-colonial Ghana, its relevance needed to be shown. And the result has been to breathe a new sense of urgency and vitality into the study of these works. So these are just two of the many reasons why collaborating with Ghanaian colleagues as part of the Global Humanities Initiative has already begun to shape reflection on the possibilities of classical Greek thinkers in the modern world. So I now leave you with Stephen Pepra, whose research is at the heart of this collaboration and from whom I have already learned so much. Stephen. Can you hear me now, please? Yeah, thank you so much, Frisbee. And thank you, Christine, for the opportunity to um, say a little bit about my project. Um, first of all, as you said, that my, I, I'm having two projects at the same time. Um, one on Plato and one on Anton Wilhelm Amo. <clears throat> I'll speak about the second character very soon. Um, the first project on Plato falls directly under the um, Cambridge African project where we are looking um, at Plato and um, community. And, and so I will say, Frisbee has said much about this project, so I'll say briefly about what I'll be doing. Um, about Plato as far as this project is concerned. And then I'll talk about Amo. <clears throat> so um, I'm currently looking at Plato's um, politics, epistemology, metaphysics, and the interconnectedness. And I'm central to um, the thematic issues that I'll be addressing is to um, challenge some of the long-standing interpretation of Plato's Republic, uh, which as Frisbee has already mentioned, um, a dominant interpretation is that Plato is the apostle of totalitarianism, uh, especially um, if you look at thinkers in the 20th century, that's what they, the idea that they have about Plato. So what I want to try to do is to um, arbitrate the various interpretations that have gone I mean, those who are attacking this interpretation and those who are um, um, for that, that interpretation. And the idea is to side with those who are um, attacking the, I mean, the totalitarian interpretation. Um, I'm also trying to do that from the 
a little bit of the Afrocentric kind of perspective. The Europeans see Plato in different light, but so I'm also trying to say that no, if you look at the Republic, for example, there are so many things, concepts that can be um, seen as relevant to um, community building. Uh, for example, when you read Plato's Republic, central to his political thesis um, are the ideas of uh, distributive justice, uh, individual recognition, and fighting political corruption, among others. And I think these Plato's ideas, I'm not saying that we should borrow all the ideas that he says. Of course, I have a problem with some of the things that he says. Um, but then these are central ideas that we can uh, borrow in terms of um, conceiving a just society for all of us to live in. So the primary aim that I seek to pursue in my project on the Republic is to expose and challenge the long-standing misreadings and misunderstandings of Plato's political thesis in the Republic. And as much as also I endeavor to reinforce and refine some of the insightful readings and understandings. So I think that is for Plato. Um, on my project on Amo, um, Amo was, Anton Wilhelm Amo was a slave boy. He has a very fascinating story um, behind him. Um, he was a slave boy who was taken from Ghana, then Gold Coast, um, as, um, to the Netherlands at the age of around four. And he was later gifted to a Duke, Duke Anton Wilhelm in Germany. He was found to be genius and uh, the Duke educated him and he eventually became um, um, a university lecturer in the modern palace, you say he became an university lecturer and uh, had a, some kind of prolific kind of um, in, um, career. He wrote works, uh, philosophical works, which are in Latin. I mean, we, we currently have three of his extant works, but there's one extra that we are still trying to find. Um, I hope you find it because it's one of his um, a magnus opus, I, I should say. And, and so that is. Um, my research on him. So why the question is why I, am I researching on Amo? I heard about Amo in 2014 at a conference in Ghana when an emeritus professor of blessed memory mentioned him in passing his presentation on indigenous African philosophizing. So, but then it struck me that why is um, this figure not known to Ghanaian scholars? Um, as he's supposed to be. So I tried to find, do a little bit of research about him. And it, unfortunately, I couldn't get any material on him in Ghana. That's a sad thing. So I asked people who are I mean, engaging in him, I mean, working on him, and I could get access to some of his materials, three of them. And so I tried to, what I seek to do on Amo is to try to do a translation. His works are in Latin to do a translation from Latin to English and to make it more student friendly. Of course, there are some translations that are, you know, I mean, I mean, have been done, but I think I want to do something that will suit the Ghanaian understanding of, you know, um, Amos philosophy. And so what my project is to look, to do a complete passing where each and every word in Amos works are passed, edited and translated with a Ghanaian um, student in mind. Um, so I, I think that generally that's what I'm doing about Amo. And part of the, the reason why I'm doing it is not only just to make him um, uh, appeal, appealing to the students, but also to project him to the, um, to the international community, intellectual community, including you. <laughs> you know? uh, um, well, and then the, I mean, I'm also looking at some, it's not just the translation and passing, but also to write works on him, to explore his ideas. And one of the cardinal um, ideas that I want to look at is whether Amo is, should be considered as an African philosopher or European philosopher. Because if his ideas, which I see are so fascinating, um, are, I mean, if, if they are so fascinating, where do they belong? 
are they relevant for the African experience or they are relevant for the European experience? Now, there are Ghanaians who have argued, Ghanaian philosophers who have argued that Amo cannot fit within the African context because he did not address issues pertaining to Africa. And to do African philosophy is to work on African culture, for example. And so since he worked extensively on European tradition, he does not fit within the African context. But when it comes to the European side, he is also not seen as, of course, he worked on Descartes and some other Europeans, but as to whether he will be embraced as an European, it's also questionable. So he's more like a beast of no nation. And so um, my, part of my research is to try to uh, see where we can fit our most philosophy. And so generally, that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much to both Frisbee and, uh, mm -hmm. and Stephen for this, uh, this, this double presentation. What I, what I uh, take from that is, is our, um, how many doors um, academic knowledge is closing instead of opening them. We, we we try to box in, uh, Stephen. Yeah. The, the problem you are facing here, you know, is he a European or is yeah. he a Ghanaian uh, thinker? Uh, my God, he's both. He's yeah. both. <laughs> so much richer. He's so much richer yeah. than than people who are just uh, belonging to one little box. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I and I think that that's that's a defect that our our uh, studies that our fields ha have have bred I, I don't know it's not it's not meant to be there it's not relevant to the interest of these uh speakers or, or these authors uh, yeah yeah it's true globally and what yeah. i what i also uh, mm -hmm. think about um what what frisbee was telling us you know this 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 idea that um the philosophers and classical philosophers writing in 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 greek um, nowadays, we are really we're really tiptoeing around their works, and and it happens with my my Persian medieval authors as well. We're tiptoeing around. We're thinking about uh, where 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 they were living, what was happening at the time, what was the 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 atmosphere around uh, these authors, and we don't jump into what they're saying. We we don't realize that they're talking to us nowadays, and they matter, and they're they're passing on across these these centuries. They're passing on very important knowledge and wisdom, and 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 instead of receiving that, we are we are, you know, pushing it back into into a, a, a sort of um, how shall I say the uh, boxes that are that are not that are not there for us. That we look at, you know, with uh, with interest, but we're not we're not embracing their uh, their messages. So mm -hmm. I think I think it's it's fantastic to see that uh, you know these ideas that are coming up. Um, thanks to thanks to a collaboration like uh, like yours. So yeah. thank you thank you very much for um, for sharing that. I don't know if anybody else uh, has any comments or wants to come yeah, back. Yeah, Christine, maybe let oh. me ch chip in something before. Um, so the question of why am I at Cambridge, um, I did one of my masters at Cambridge just so I could improve my Latin proficiency to work on Amo. Uh, and then after the, my master's and a PhD, I could get um, um, my fellowship at Gerton College with um, support from the Aborada Research Fund. And the project is also being funded by um, the British Academy. So just just by passing information for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Frisbee, you wanted to. No, I I, I like very much um, how you put that point, uh, Christine. About it, there's something about the niche specializations that that sort of cultivated by our uh, departmental framework here, which is something that I think collaborations of this kind can can really help to break down. Because you're right, those sort of niche um, domains of expertise encourage, as you put it, this kind of tiptoeing of contextualization and historical skills and philological skills, all of which are valuable and, and, and absolutely we need. But um, 
I can't imagine myself sort of teaching a course like the relevance of places republic in 20th century Britain. That would be seen as sort of it would make my colleagues blush if, if I suggested such a thing. Let them, let them, let them. Yes, blush. and I think what's been so great about um, about this collaboration with Ghana is that partly so a figure like Nkrumah, I think, is 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 absolutely fascinating in his work, uh, philosophy for. Um, decolonization um you know part of it is as i understand it what's happening there is there was explicit interrogation in post-colonial ghana about the place of classics why are we reading this stuff is it just a colonial import and in order to justify the place of classics there was a, a fascinating you know decades of interrogation um about its value and it was justified if it could be shown that it had practical relevance. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Plato's Republic, not by Nkrumah particularly, who didn't really like the Republic, he liked other Greek thinkers, <laughs> not the Republic, but 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 it, there was this tradition of thinking about the Republic in particular as an example of practice relevant thinking. But the point there is that um, as opposed to the sort of niche specialisms uh, that, that we have, this is an example of, we're looking at this discipline, interrogating it. Does it have a place in post-colonial Ghana? Well, if it does, then we've got to show that it's relevant to modern issues and concerns. Yeah. And that to me has been so exciting for breathing a new sense of sort of urgency into the study of these texts. And 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 perhaps I, I should just be bolder about me <laughs> allowing my students to blush and, and raising those questions. Yeah. Yes, Hans. I will welcome the day that all lecturers at Cambridge have blushing faces and do great things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be lovely. Um, I just want to ask Stephen, you talked about Amon. Can you say something about his ideas? You've whetted my appetite. So Yeah, um, so he works um, on philosophy of mind. And um, um, he inherits a tradition. Um, like, please, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So he inherits um, a long-standing um, perennial problem on the body, the body mind problem, as you said. And so his main contenders were um, Descartes um, and others. So he agrees with Descartes, for example, that the mind is distinct from the body. But then his position is that Descartes didn't draw the distinction distinction nearly neatly enough. So what he did was to sh argue that sensation does not, um, the mind does not sense at all. The mind does not feel anything material or bodily. It, it, it has a compact, it, it has a commerce. He's using the word commerce, it has a commerce with the body, but it does, it does neither surface nor um, uh, engage in any other thing with, um, with the body in which it suffers. Now, one of the moral lessons that we draw from, or one of the implications that he draws is that the body, the mind is immaterial. And therefore, if we can predicate immateriality to all human beings, then it does not matter what, whether the person is black or white or green. So it is central to his lost work to um, argue for liberation of the, I mean, the other races who were enslaved by then. That once everybody has a mind which is immaterial, which is a spark of God in, you know, a spark of God, it follows necessarily that God is in everyone, regardless of the color, regardless of the race. And so no one should be imprisoned if God is in everyone. So that is one of the impl key implications that we draw. So, but. Then the idea is um, his central ideas are on philosophy of mind. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you 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 hit a part uh, on on a on a very very important uh, thinker there. Clearly. Yeah. He's. I mean, he's. Yeah. It is. We are. We are still trying um, trying to find his lost work. That is um, the right of the moors. That is the right more is the right of the slave. You know, does the slave have a right? Yeah. And then apart from arguing from the philosophy of mind perspective, he's also arguing that um, the, um, sorry, um, 
the Germans by then was a Roman Republic, quote unquote, German uh, Roman Republic. And the Roman Republic, as German called itself, was using the Justinian law for its, I mean, within its jurisdiction. And the Justinian law, as in the Roman era, permitted or did not enslave its, I um, mean, colonies. And so German doesn't have the, if German calls itself the um, Roman Republic, I mean, empire, and uses the Justinian law, Roman, Rome does not have, or German does not have any right whatsoever to enslave any of its colonies, which they were doing the, on the contrary. So he has so many fascinating ideas that I think when we shed light on him, um, I think we, um, <laughs> we will see him as a very important figure. If we, whether he fits within the African context or whether he fits within the European context is inconsequential to, um, I mean, noting him as a very important figure in the history of ideas. Yeah, yeah Frisbee, yeah. Hi, thanks so much, Stephen, um, for that. It was quite interesting, actually, how um, when you were talking there about some of Amo's central ideas, um, the philosophy of mind and yeah. uh, his nature of a mind, you then also beautifully uh, illustrated the practice, rele the practice relevant dimension of yeah, that yeah. thinking by turning it to... Um, so that was anyway. I just wanted to flag that that was lovely. Um, but one of the the um, questions that I wanted to ask is obviously the reason why you're pursuing this project on ammo yeah. within a classics department is because of the Latin component yeah, yeah, that he yeah. wrote in Latin. So um, I don't know anything at all about about uh, Latin in in this period. Is is the Latin of that time? Is it eighteenth century Latin? Is that is yeah, that eighteenth uh, century Latin? Yeah. What is that? What relationship does that bear to the sort of Latin that you study um, when you when you're reading Cicero, for example? Here, yeah, I see. <laughs> is it quite niche, or is it is it the same? Yeah, it's. I mean, um, there's. In, I, I would say that it's only in terms of vocabulary that there, you can see some kind of um, uh, changes, you know. But then the structure and almost everything. I mean the write-up is almost the same like when I'm reading Cicero. And I would say that the ancient Roman kind of, um, you know, even within the Roman era, we had phases in the development of the Latin language. You know, the Ciceronian is a little bit harder than, let's say, the Tacitian kind of um, Latin. And so you can see the same kind of niche within there. So I, I have some kind of difficulty, let's say, in reading Cicero than in reading Amo. Okay. Yeah. So, but then it is almost the same, I, I should say, except these kind of few nuances. Yes. So do you think that that's, that's been probably the main hurdle into the accessibility of AMO in Ghana is that, that there just aren't good translations of... of Thank of you for this. bringing this point. I, I was trying to, I mean, beat the time, but I think the reason why AMO um, was not received in Ghana until recently I would say it has less to do with language because um, when the University of Ghana was established in 1948 by the British, some of the courses, um, those who were admitted to the university had done a level where Latin and Greek were required compulsory. And so language proficiency wasn't a problem in if um, we were to talk about Amos work. If the people were committed to work on Amo, they would have because they, they had the, uh, the linguistic competence. So I, I see it more as political, the neglect of Amo as more political than intellectual. And I explained briefly, um, the, the first generation of African philosophers who had European education um, went to Africa to start African philosophy. And so they, um, Th that generation is past. And so they, they consider themselves as the forerunners of African philosophy. And then if you could, I mean, position that, if you posit Amo as beginning the era of African philosophy, then you begin to unseat those who consider themselves to be African philosophers, the, the forerunners. So that's why I see th that kind of, um, you know, politics there. It's not necessarily because they lacked the knowledge to translate him and make him central to, um, I mean, the teaching at the University of Ghana. Huh? To do I so, see, so, so, they need right. to unseat themselves as yeah. the, the forerunners of African philosophy. 
I see. So there was actually a lot at stake in in Christine's question about where he's located. Yeah. For you, it's it's that issue that yeah, that, that's, that he's been eclipsed, not yeah. the language. Thank yeah, you. linguistics. I, uh, linguistics. Are, um, uh, problem is not a problem at all, in my view. I think I may be mistaken, but I think that's it is not a problem for me. Okay, I've got to I've got to come here and uh, uh, stop this uh, this, <laughs> this fascinating uh, Q and A. Um, we thank you thank you very much both of you for uh, for uh, contributing that to um, to the workshop. And now we move to the second uh, pair of uh, speakers in this afternoon. Um, Professor Paul Anderson is uh, His Royal Highness Prince Al Walid Ben Talal University Associate Professor in Middle Eastern Studies, and also he's the Associate Director of the Prince Al Walid Ben Talal Center of Islamic Studies at FAMES. That's quite a long, a long uh, title. Two long titles, uh, Paul. Um, Paul is a social anthropologist, and you're working on the articulation of economic, moral and political life. Um, and uh, with Paul is uh, Professor Egdunas Rasius. Um, yes, you, you, you are there, you're with us, hello. Um, you received your PhD at the University of Helsinki and your Professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at the Vitota Magnus University in Lithuania. Um, Professor uh, Ratsius' uh, research interests encompass Eastern European Muslim communities and the governance of religion in post-communist Europe. So, um, Paul and Egdunas, uh, welcome on, you know, on the workshop and the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Christine. And, um... The, uh, just say a couple of words by way of introduction. I know Agdenas will sort of present his the research he's been doing recently, and then I'll sort of add a little bit on on the end of that. But um, the um, we we actually got to know each other several years ago through um, being hosted by Agdenas in the University of Kaunas in Lithuania, and that was as part of a sort of an exchange program. Um, the Center of Islamic Studies took some students and uh, lecturers uh, from Cambridge and. We had a program called Cambridge Inn, where we tried to connect um, people in Cambridge to corresponding academics at various levels of seniority in other parts of the world where there are Islamic and Middle Eastern studies programs. And the idea was to think about the difference that location makes in the um, study of uh, Islam in the Middle East. Uh, so we were particularly pleased to connect with the University of Karnas and with Agdunas, who's um, had the editorship of the Journal of Muslims in Europe and um, looking at similar questions from, from a different geographical perspective. And now he's sort of, uh, we're able to return his hospitality by hosting him uh, at the Center of Islamic Studies where he's pursuing his research project on Islam in uh, post-communist uh, Europe and Central Asia. So I'll hand over to Dunas for, for, for more. Right, uh, thanks Paul, uh, thanks Christine. Um, <clears throat> I hope you hear me well. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a rather late afternoon already here in Lithuania because we're two hours ahead of the UK. Um, so as I was introduced, I'm a Lithuanian, um, based in Lithuania, although my pillow is in Vilnius, in the capital city. Uh, my salary comes from Konas, Vidalas Magnus University. Uh, we don't have a proper department uh, that would cover the things I'm covering and uh, the things that I you know, grade four, put it this way, we don't even have a religious study department, never mind Islamic studies. Uh, we don't really have a Middle Eastern studies. Um, we do have programs that sort of partially cover these things. So I have always felt um, alone, put it this way, although of course I have uh, numerous colleagues around me, but they are clueless about the things I do. And you know, when it comes to Islam, they just don't know anything about it. And then I've been looking around, you know, for people who I could connect with so that, you know, simply sit over lunch and chat about things that are relevant and interesting to all of us or both of us. And then I'm very glad that I found uh, such a person in uh, Paul and then and I've been talking about all sorts of um, things. And I, I had been sharing my insights or sort of uh, telling of my research 
that I have done and then that I would want to do. And then and this is how we sort of came together and decided, well, I might as well um, be sort of affiliated with the University of Cambridge in my ongoing uh, research. But before I go into what I'm up to now, let me just tell you how I ended up at where I am. Some seven years ago, when I was doing research for a book that was commissioned by uh, uh, Edinburgh University Press, and it was called Muslims uh, in Eastern Europe, that was supposed to be a complementary book to your Nielsen's Muslims in Western Europe. Uh, while doing field work, you know, traveling to these places, I had to cover 21 uh, post-communist Eastern European country in 80,000 words. This is something impossible, I know, but I had to do that. So um, while doing research, I came across something that you might say puzzled me or interested me, but I couldn't really do about this anything in that particular book because of the lack of the pagers. And the thing that I thought I had noticed was um, the sense that uh, Muslim religious organizations in post-communist Europe, not throughout it, but in certain countries, did resemble to me when I went and talked to the people there, uh, they resembled what I would think would be uh, church-like institutions. And then when I say church, sort of implying Christian churches with ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical structures, you know, whoever, bishop, pope, or whatever you want at the top, and then all these hierarchies and so on. But that, I thought maybe that's just something, you know, I I felt so, but it's probably not the case. Nonetheless, I took a research for another book, which eventually uh, I produced, and it's called um, Islam in Post-Communist Eastern Europe Between Churchification and Secularization. I did research in some of the countries uh, where I got convinced that what I had noticed in the previous research is indeed something interesting in, in terms of that there's this phenomenon of what I uh, call churchification of uh, Muslim religious organizations in post-communist Eastern Europe. And having done that research, at some point I thought, hmm, is this peculate to Eastern Europe, or we could look beyond minority settings. And of course, only naturally people would suggest, why don't you do research in Western Europe? But I think there are too many colleagues who have been doing research on Islam and Muslims in Western Europe. Let them do research. They speak languages. I do speak some, but not all uh, Western European languages. So I thought, okay, if they choose so, they could pursue this. Although I think that when it comes to Western Europe, I would not be in a position to argue that I do witness what I have labeled as churchification of Islam, I would say that it's a different process in Western Europe. But in Eastern Europe, I noticed this churchification and I thought that's a minority setting. What about the majority settings? And not going into the Middle East, although one could probably easily um, go uh, there, I thought or I decided I'd look into Central Asia and see whether those things, the, the processes, the phenomenon uh, that I had noticed in some of these European countries, post-communist Eastern European countries, we could also observe or grasp in, in some of the uh, Central Asian countries. But you know, sim uh, instead of simply replicating, you know, having another book on uh, churchification now in Central Asia, I thought I'd, I'd like to focus more and within this broader sort of churchification, I'm now focusing, and this is what, what I'm about to say is um, uh, related to the ongoing uh, project that is also somehow related to University of Cambridge here. It's um, the imam training and ecclesiastical structures in Central Asia. Uh, and I have already uh, tried uh, to do some preliminary uh, field work in Kazakhstan. <clears throat> this is why I miss my voice, not, not because I spoke so much, but because I contracted some virus. I call it Kazakhstan virus, not exactly Wuhan, but it's some kind of Kazakhstan virus. And I lost my voice. I have regained it, but you know, it's at 85% or something. So I tried to do that research uh, a month ago um, by going to the Mufti ad, by trying to talk to people who are in charge of imam training and the other things. And it has turned out to be a very, very uh, challenging task compared to uh, my earlier research, in particular in Europe, where you had a very easy access to people you were interested in, be they, you know, the grand muftis, the top sort of guys in the ecclesiastical structures, or anyone else uh, in uh, Kazakhstan, it proved to be much, much more difficult. Um, and then this has sound, uh, this, this has now sort of um, 
gave me extra questions as to you know how far I can pursue that project. Um, it's not a project that is funded by any institution. I haven't promised anything to an anyone, um, or maybe to Paul uh, and myself, uh, that I want to pursue that research. But it's uh, it's a uh, I don't know. Can we call it the 19th century kind of uh, uh, research when you decide as a scholar you want to do something rather than when you apply and there are these buzzwords, the sustainability, environment, this and that, and you cram in. The these words, then you get that project and say yes, and then the deliverables are that you have to meet stakeholders, shareholders, do things that you don't want to do. So, you know, it's not a kind of a project. I mean, I'm not being financed by anyone. Um, it's my own funds. Uh, although, of course, the university supports me, and, and I do get some uh, um, travel uh, funding uh, for research and so on. So um, I, I need to decide how far I want to push this, because it appears to be much more difficult than I had anticipated. They're very sort of... Mm, um, not that they're suspicious of what I do, but, you know, being a foreigner, uh, although I speak what I assume is perfect Russian, uh, but, you know, they, they, they're they not sure what my in intentions are. So, you know, when you meet these people, you, you really need to either be there very uh, frequently for, for prolonged periods of time or, or, or it's, you know, some other ways you can gather your material, which, you know, the secondary sources probably don't uh, appeal to me as much. So um, I still definitely wish to pursue that project to its maximum, which would be if um, uh, attained uh, a book um, uh, of a comparative nature where I'd compare imam training and ecclesiastical structures. Muslim ecclesiastical structures in both Central Asia and the Balkan countries where I already have done some research. Um, but if this uh, uh, falls short of it, then, you know, um, a series of articles may be um, on either individual cases uh, or something comparative would materialize. So I'm not yet sure what I can attain. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm full of good intentions, put it this way. And I'd like to, 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 to push it further, not only because uh, both uh, these regions, Eastern Europe and, and Central Asia, although they are on the radar, you know, I, I wouldn't say that um, no one has published anything in English on those two regions when it comes to, to, to Muslim communities and their organizations. Um, I would even say there's plenty, but there's not enough compared to Western Europe in particular. And um, myself being an Eastern European, I always feel that we are somehow, well, not exactly second class, uh, but uh, we're, you know, well, you guys are there somewhere in the corner, stay there. We do research. So if it's Islam in Europe, it is Islam in the UK. Where else? What is Europe? Oh, oh there, there are these other countries besides the UK. Well, the, the, we know that's France and Germany. Are there any other countries? Yeah, there are, and, and there are Muslim communities and so on. So I think, um, I, I kind of feel I have a mission to to to, to push or pursue research uh, uh, in these countries, and then if I could come up with something comparative um, rather than just case studies, that would probably be beneficial not only to myself but uh, but to the readership. Um, so maybe I'll stop at this point, and and then if I have provoked any questions, I'd be looking forward to, to to explaining what I mean by certain things, even you know all the way to what do you mean by churchification of Islam or Muslim organizations, wherever that could be. Um, and I look forward to any other reactions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul and Egdunas. Uh, that's uh, that's really a very um, very interesting worlds and I, I, I want to say can of worms that you're opening for us because uh, clearly it's a it's a difficult um, a touchy uh, topic that you that you're trying to uh, work on in in Central Asia definitely um, and so just to open the um, the, uh, the uh, discussion I was um, the fact that you are that you chose uh, to compare the um, um, churchification of Islam in, in the Balkans, which is your home um, habitat, if I can say that, uh, with, with uh, Central Asia, is that because these are two uh, regions that have been, um, that have been living under communist um, regimes? And uh, if so, um, don't you think that um, the difficulty that you have in 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 um, having people opening up to the questions on Islam in Central Asia is not due to a sort of tradition of fear, um, a tradition of um, you know, and you're using Russian to interrogate them. Is that isn't that something that is still um, 
um, how shall I say, a bit a bit worrying for for people in uh, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan? Don't you don't you think that might be a, a reason why they're a bit hermetic? Um, thanks a lot. Um, let me start with this sort of language aspect, and I'll go back into the Soviet, post-Soviet, or pre-Soviet, or pre-communist. Um, now, when it comes to language, I wish they spoke Arabic. I'd love to speak Arabic with them, uh, but they don't speak Arabic. Uh, they speak, you know, Kazakh or Turkic um, uh, languages, and they prefer uh, Russian to English. Uh, when I was teaching uh, um, in Kazakhstan, I thought that I'd, you know, teach in English. Um, I had never taught in Russian. When I came, I said, no, 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 teach in Russian. That's a proper language. Um, so, you know, they prefer Russian. They're not afraid of Russian language. Uh, they may not be happy with a Russian passport, but I don't hold a Russian passport. I have a Lithuanian passport. That's the EU passport, if you want. Well, I mean, you know, in the UK, maybe it, it doesn't sort of um, <clears throat> uh, sound good anymore. But uh, in Kazakhstan, it does. Uh, so, you know, um, being a Lithuanian is actually a very safe thing. And, and uh, I'm really proud, not only because I'm a Lithuanian, but when I travel and I used to travel in the Middle East and elsewhere and I show a Lithuanian passport, they only they have only good sort of, you know, uh, um, sentiments towards uh, my country and, and, and that passport. So the language is not an issue, actually. Um, uh, they Almost all of them, at least the elder generation, uh, they do speak Russian fairly well. Uh, um, the younger ones may not, but then some would speak English, some others maybe even Arabic. Um, so, so the language language is certainly not the issue. Uh, uh, the issue would be, you know, where I come from, and I don't come from Russia, which they may not, or on an individual basis, like. Now, but going back to your you know, more serious uh, question on, on, you know, uh, what unites uh, uh, these two regions is certainly it is a post-communist experience because the question of uh, how the states behave towards um, religious organizations the minority and majority and we could talk about you know, differences and commonalities but um, we very often speak about these post-communist countries in terms of regaining religiosity that you know people had been suppressed um, they wanted to pray and they were not allowed and they suddenly were allowed and they were happy and now they all pray throughout the day which is not the case we know uh, and then this you know secularization in, in those countries you know went very deeply but th then uh, what we see is that the states the governments uh, had to somehow relate and deal with this new situation where um, this uh, religious pluralism or religious freedoms would, you know, come back to the fore. And then uh, it was for them to decide how they relate to uh, religion and religious organizations. And then my argument has been uh, that in many of the countries, it would oscillate between two. Churchification, which is a form of control, but a soft form, a pleasant form. We sort of make you into a church-like institution where we recognize you as a church-like institution. You're responsible for all the flock. We have amicable relations. We're all happy, but then there are these bad people. So what do we do? Well, we securitize them. So, you know, there, there are these two ends, if you want, the churchification and uh, securitization. And uh, now, the securitization part might be something new, and it depends on how we look at it, whether we would uh, see it back in the communist times. I would say that in the communist times, it was more of a licensed approach to control uh, religion, and, and it wasn't securitization, properly speaking. Some might argue that uh, this is where churchification may have started, but I would then say, no, that's a pre-communist thing. It started way back in the whenever. Uh, in Russia and Russian possessions uh, in the uh, late 18th century, in um, the Austro-Hungarian possessions of the Muslim lands in the late 19th century. So it's a much longer process. Uh, now, however, of course, uh, the new conditions, the sort of post-communist reality, well, the globalization, if you want, they add um, extra sort of um, dimensions here. And, and therefore, of course, it's not simply a continuation or a reinstitution of the same process, but it it had started way, way, way back, and it certainly is not 
a post-communist phenomenon, nor it is even a com communist time. So therefore, I would say that uh, uh, what unites um, these regions is, although two different empires, the Russian Empire on the one side and then the uh, Austro-Hungarian, if you want, the Ottoman Empire also prior to that, um, two different countries, uh, two different empires, but th that is a common history in a way that then was united under this communist ideology and behavior, and then the reactions, which are also very different. I only covered the countries that sort of suited my uh, argument, uh, because in the post-communist European part, you could find countries where you don't see either or, I mean, churchification or even securitization of Islam. And then I could bring an example of Estonia, where I don't see any of the two. So, you know, it's yet another country, but some people would argue, but they don't even have Muslims. So how would you see a churchification of Islam where they don't have a community? Well, they do, but they're a very small one. So um, these two regions, of course, are very different. And, and, and as I've already said, uh, in most of the uh, Balkan countries, Muslims uh, make minorities. They could be significant, very sort of sizable, but they would still be minorities. We could say in, in Albania, Kosovo, the two countries that I haven't covered and the dynamics there is slightly different. So in the Muslim majority European countries, I don't even see the process that I see in the uh, countries where Muslims uh, constitute minority. But then I go into Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, where it is Muslim majorities. And then, and then the question is, you know, okay, the nature of the societies, the nature of the states is um, profoundly different if you want, but do we see the same processes? And I um, suspect we do with their differences, but also commonalities also. Thank you. Thank you, Ignas. Um, is there anyone else who would have a, a question or a, a further, a further, um, but so can I, uh, Paul and, and, and Ignas, so how do you, how do you work together in the, uh, in the um, Center for Islamic, uh, Islamic Studies in, in Cambridge and how, how is a, a collaboration uh, uh, working between the uh, about your research interests. Thanks, Christine. I think well, one thing to say in terms of our shared, I mean, we have sort of various practical things. We, I mean, Agdunas will, will be one of the mentors at our forthcoming graduate symposium, engaging with some of our students who work on Islam in, in Europe. Uh, but um, conceptually, we, we've also got an interest in thinking about um, regions and, you know, what's the scale of sort of the geographical scale uh, that can make some of these similarities and, and, and comparisons uh, viable. Um, so my research, I think, that sort of touches on some of these themes is related to um, connections between East Asia and West Asia. And I've been looking at the uh, some of the economic networks and trading links uh, that connect um, a wholesale market city in, in the east of China, in Yiwu, to um, uh, markets in West Asia, in the Middle East. And um, uh, so I've been tracking some of these networks and talking to, to traders from Syria, from Yemen, who've moved around um, and are, are now um, sort of uh, merchants based in China. Um, but interestingly, their, their careers were sort of forged at different uh, nodes within what one might think of as Eurasia. So Moscow was particularly important as a, a place where they learned to um, how to trade across borders, um, how to where they acquired the sort of skills and um, uh, the capital um, the networks that they are making use of now in in in, in China, um, and these are individuals who were often sort of put into kind of Eurasian um, mobilities through uh, higher education and through um, scholarships from uh, some in the Soviet period and then post-Soviet Russia, uh, also uh, um, educational patronage from China brought Syrians and Yemenis to the University of Shanghai, for example. So you have uh, an interesting kind of layering of different moments in history uh, and, and also different geographies, different Eurasian geographies where the um, so you sort of have a Soviet Eurasia, which is a, a vision of a connected Eurasia through uh, you know, international socialism, through 
educational patronage of, of the Middle East, which brings people to, uh, to Moscow, brings people uh, to different uh, parts of Central Asia. They then move from um, uh, university into commerce and become uh, uh, traders in the sort of 1990s uh, period where things are, are sort of opening up. And then the 2000s, when, when China, Chinese globalization is, is sort of getting momentum, they, they then move again. Um, so I'm thinking about sort of how these different geographies, how, you, uh, how a sort of Soviet and then a post-Soviet vision of Eurasia, and now a, a sort of Chinese-centered vision of Eurasia, are kind of woven together by, by the, the, these um, uh, 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 traders and merchants. Um, so, so I think, you know, for me, it's about thinking about um, uh, a region and trans-regional connections and, uh, and therefore this idea of the post-communist uh, world or the, the post-communist arena, uh, the post-communist experience um, is, is sort of what interests me in Agunas's work and, and sort of, you know, how to sort of escape the rather restrictive geographical uh, categories that we're used to in, in area studies departments. Um, uh, so, so I think that's where I see some of these connections, but obviously it's also about, you know, the post-communist experience and how different layers of history can sort of coexist almost. Um, the, 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 the traders who've been shaped by a sort of Soviet and a post-Soviet era um, are, are now kind of drawing on those skills and networks to, to make Chinese globalization work too. Yeah. Well, fascinating. I could yeah, probably so add, if you, if you allow me. Um, you know, when I was explaining, it might have looked as if I'm, you know, more into history, which is not the case. And then, of course, I'm uh, firmly um, embedded in, in a contemporary uh, sort of um, affairs, what's brewing now, so to say. And then, as Paul said, you know, the sort of the, the transnational sort of dimension, because if I uh, argue that we have this churchification uh, process, which is then nationalization, because ultimately then they turn or they're being turned into national Muslim churches, if anything. But uh, this nationalization or turning into national Muslim churches uh, works against the globalization trends and, and a movement of people, ideas and everything else. And of course, I don't do research on Salafism, Mohammedism, whatever we want, but it's there. It's inevitably there because uh, this is the, you know, uh, the mirror sort of um, community or imagined community of adversaries against whom both the state and the local uh, uh, Muslim uh, religious hierarchies work. So uh, very much relates to, to, to what Paul was saying, uh, although, of course, he's he's more interested in in, 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 in less um, religious sort of side, put it this way. Uh, there is always religion somewhere, even if, you know, if people, they, they, when they talk, they might say, I don't like religion, I'm not religious, but then they do talk about religion and then the ideas move and then when people hear each other and you know then they take over so in, in central asia in particular as i said i, I won't be focusing on that but uh, this sort of that transnational movement uh, uh, um you know of all sorts of uh, um revivalist movements muslim revivalist movements uh took place in, in, in the past decades and, and this is what the states are grappling with so uh it's certainly part of this much bigger picture but then i uh, only started uh um, collaborating with uh, the university of cambridge uh, what was that march so you know we still need to figure out where we are and what we're doing and i just simply immediately would thank uh the um you know the university and of course uh paul uh personally for having uh, um, allowed me to you know um, or given me opportunity to use the library because this is something and when i said i feel alone it's not only that i don't have people to share with but it's all, also the library which i don't have at home so it's it's yet another thing <laughs> some might say it's not that much of a collaboration but it is. I mean, you know, I need to you know a library. I need to 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 go somewhere and find uh, materials. So that that's yet another dimension. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That um, yeah, the 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 Cambridge Library is very rich, and it's uh, it's an opportunity to share that essential tool for research with um, with international um, visitors and inter international collaborators. Yeah, that's a different, important dimension that we can that we can contribute to uh, to research abroad. Absolutely. So thank you both.
Paul and um, Agdunas for uh, for your uh, contribution to our workshop. We the next we have about five minutes break if you want, and then um, we come back at um, promptly at two thirty for um, Oksana Starshova's uh, presentation, and then um, Vincenzo and uh, Vinoth. Yeah, see you in five minutes.
So hello, hello back everyone. I'll just, um, yeah, well, it's it's uh, promptly 2.30, so there we start again. Um, and so I'm very, very happy to introduce uh, Professor Oksana Starshova. Um, Professor Starshova is Associate Professor at the English Philology Department of Petro Mohila Black Sea National University in Ukraine. Her research covers American literature, postmodernism, geocriticism, urban spaces and literature, urban spaces and literature, and migration literature. Um, um, Professor Starshova, you will speak to us about migration narratives of New York City, the research you are conducting at the Faculty of English at Cambridge. And uh, the faculty is represented here by the head of, of the faculty, Professor Raphael Lein. Professor Starshova, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for this possibility to share uh, my ideas with the global humanities uh, community. And uh, I certainly want to uh, express my gratitude to uh, Cara, you mentioned uh, due to which I'm here at the British Academy, Faculty of English, Pembroke College and the Pembroke, uh, Pembroke College Fellows, uh, Dr. James Gardam and Alex Howen, who uh, found interest in my research and uh, gave a hand of help and support in this difficult situation when my great suddenly became from the theory, it turned from theory into real life experience. And by the way, uh, Cambridge is uh, uh, also a good place. It's not New York, but it's a good place to study migration because it can also be considered as a uh, intellectual migration hub. Yeah. Uh, so uh, about my project. Why, uh, why migration? Nobody uh, doubts uh, nowadays that it's one of the phenomena of the modern day world. What I'm interested in most of all is the sensibility of migration uh, that is uh, with an emphasis on a place, uh, on the ways in which the idea of the place uh, in uh, both meanings as uh, physical space and memory of placeness is formed and represented in fiction. A migrant writer has to create a place uh, for him or herself each time recreating a city and adding a human dimension to the city as a text. And second, why it is New York? Because um, uh, it is the second essential focus of my research because it's um, uh, one of the cities that holds, holds the sense of Americanness more than any other. Uh, due to its history, location, architecture, community, people that might be considered uh, representative uh, of the whole nation. At the same time, it is particularly unique uh, because uh, for many uh, migrants, it became a frontier and a border zone on the way to the inside of the country. Although migrants have constituted a great part of New York population since in, uh, its foundation and therefore have contributed to the literary imagination uh, throughout decades, the beginning of the 21st century has witnessed the new surge of uh, the text specifically focused on the migrants' point of view. Uh, such shifts in the perception of the city provide a necessary estrangement and open up new perspectives as they express the thorough interest uh, to the places of New York that uh, can be stereotypified, mythologized, and, and unknown. They depict the clash between the city imaginary and uh, its real urban landscapes. The city uh, is reinvented from the perspectives of different cultural and uh, geographical backgrounds. So revisiting New York uh, with a migrant's eye uh, gives, uh, enables us to reconsider the history and myth of America. And uh, uh, Bertrand Westphal said, uh, uh, just as there is a Dublin subject to the gaze of the visitor, there is a symbolic Dublin with less anchorage. It is the Dublin of works of fiction, end of quote. And we can substitute the word Dublin, the name Dublin, with, any, uh, with the name of any other city. And uh, uh, we will see uh, that uh, New York uh, bears its own particular symbolism uh, and especially in the situation of transition. So 
Uh, I'm uh, first. Uh, I'm trying to identify the factors that uh, accompany geographical and cultural transition in the process of migration, and uh, among these, I can see the. Uh, such notions as modality of migration, uh, which is uh, related to the possibility of return, the situation of migration, whether it is forced or uh, voluntary migration, whether it is a situation of, uh, but uh, I don't consider actually the situation of tourism or nomadism, uh, tourism, uh, but uh, mostly it is um, the situation of expatriation, exile uh, or refugee. And to some extent, uh, nomadism can be also considered. Uh, other factors are uh, geography of identity, um, um, uh, the ideas of belonging and possession. And I would say uh, we also have to consider here uh, the means of transplantation of one's own culture uh, um, and um, geography. So uh, migration uh, suggests uh, the situation of liminality and um, uh, we, we will, uh, I, I'm trying to see how um, in this liminal state, the city uh, is uh, being reinvented. Uh, so um, another uh, important um, part of my research is the, the methodology of uh, geocriticism, which I think is um, uh, resonates uh, resonates with my research because um, it uh, it focuses on uh, the real and imaginary spaces uh, introduced by uh, Bertrand uh, Westphal and uh, continued with uh, his translated to the English speaking world, Robert Talley. Um, it, uh, as Bertrand uh, uh, Westphal says, it's the poetics which is not aimed at the study of the means of spatial representations in literature, but at the cataloging of relationship between real geographical space and its literary images, at the study of the dynamics of these images from text to text. Um, uh, end of quote. Among the set of categories uh, that apply uh, to this uh, search, uh, research of uh, the city text from the uh, migrants' perspective are the ideas of transgressivity, and New York is, uh, as I already mentioned, as the border space and the space of uh, uh, porous borders uh, is also um, uh, the space of tra uh, transgression. Uh, the, the next one is uh, spatial temporality. And we know that uh, in the 20th century, especially in the second uh, half, the idea of space um, uh, got to prominence. And uh, uh, in uh, many texts, uh, we can see, oh, in several texts, we can see that um, um, the space is uh, reconsidered from a uh, 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 temporal perspective. I, I will uh, say a couple of minutes later about that. And um, uh, the, uh, the other ideas of uh, geocriticism are uh, polysensoriality and multifocalization. That is the focus from different perspectives. So among the uh, texts uh, that um, I consider uh, are the texts uh, of the uh, writers who have different attitude uh, or who have different uh, uh, situation of migration and um, uh, who come uh, from uh, different uh, cultural backgrounds. Uh, my project started with the Ukrainian poet Vasil Makhno, who immigrated uh, to the United States on a green card visa um, in 2002. And one of the uh, first collections of his poetry uh, uh, in that period was uh, the 38 poems of New York and uh, something else, where he tries to, uh, to find his own space uh, uh, wandering around the streets of New York. And um, this, uh, uh, the space of New York um, becomes um, re um, uh, uh, visible uh, through uh, uh, in uh, several points, aspects. Uh, the first one is uh, the outer space of the Atlantic Ocean, which is uh, uh, which he considers as the space of uh, border that he has to uh, he had to, uh, to cross on the way to America, uh, as uh, the place of uh, 
uh, um, drowning and resurrection, it, uh, these motives uh, are present in uh, his uh, poems. Uh, so he associates himself uh, with the Christ that uh, carries on the, the word, capital letter word. Uh, so uh, he, uh, uh, and also on the other hand, it's uh, the place of alienation. Uh, it's the place of winter, uh, which uh, he, um, of winter cold, uh, 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 that uh, many migrants uh, can, um, uh, not uh, the cold uh, that ma many migrants consider as inimical. Uh, um, so uh, coldness uh, is uh, associated with the situation of migration. Uh, so uh, the other places that uh, Mahno highlights in his poetry are the locations of New York uh, connected with uh, culture, arts, uh, like uh, um, uh, uh, experimental theater La Mama or um, uh, Maxoli's Old House or um, uh, different cafes in, where, in which uh, Ukrainian uh, diaspora poets uh, got together, discussed their attitudes to poetry back in the 60s. And certainly he uh, sees uh, also New York as everyday life. Uh, he notices some uh, street scenes in uh, Brooklyn, in uh, Astor Place, in New York Port, uh, everywhere. Uh, the other one uh, that um, uh, that is of interest, uh, the other um, writer that is of interest with his novel, um, Open City, is Ted Jukol of uh, Nigerian origin, who uh, grew up in Nigeria until he was uh, 17, and then he uh, uh, went or migrated to the United States because, but he was born in the United States. And in his Open City uh, novel, he um, uh, also wanders around New York, but uh, it's interesting how he um, uh, reinvents uh, the space from the perspective of time, because in each place that he observes, uh, he notices the flow of time and he, um, uh, he uh, uh, gets back to the history of this place. And it turns out that it, uh, most of the places uh, um, the, that are memorialized uh, or um, somewhere hidden in New York um, bear the uh, history of violence, bear the colonial history like African burial ground, like uh, the uh, backyard of the Trinity Church with the story of white whales uh, and certainly 9-11 memorial and many, many other things. Actually, uh, this uh, novel becomes a collection of uh, New York spaces uh, reconsidered from the point of history. And uh, the other one uh, is Isabel Allende uh, uh, of Chilean origin, who wrote her uh, uh, novel in the midst of winter in uh, 2017 um, in uh, Spanish. And uh, what uh, about three uh, migrants from Latin America uh, uh, who uh, got in, uh, who uh, uh, we see them uh, during the thunderstorm? Uh, they get together and they have to overcome uh, the um, the consequences of a, a car accident together. Uh, but uh, what uh, certainly uh, Isabel Allende tells the stories of uh, their migration, either it is a story of exile, it is either it is a story of escape from uh, psychological trauma or it is a story of um, escape from um, uh, gangsters in Guatemala. But uh, what is interesting, all those characters try to overcome this um, uh, 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 inimical condition with the help of first community, second uh, uh, right, and third the memory of geography that they bear with them. Uh, for them, um, we can uh, trace semantically that uh, the place of New York is somewhere in the basement, uh, cold place, uh, 
one of the characters to, to keep warm starts uh, uh, making her uh, favorite Chilean soup cazuela. Uh, so, uh, and, but uh, uh, the place of Chile, uh, the geography of Chile, although uh, it is not really friendly to people, but she uh, reminiscence of that as the place of warmth and sun and, um, and color. Uh, and uh, one more novel uh, that I have uh, got into my collection of novels so far is uh, the novel of Joseph O'Neill, uh, written in 2011, Netherlands, uh, which, uh, uh, which is a uh, recap on the Great Gatsby story, although the Great Gatsby that starts with the uh, uh, murder of the uh, protagonist, uh, a kind of uh, con man from uh, uh, the Caribbeans who um, uh, tries to create uh, or recreate the uh, so um, I would say post colonial uh, um, uh, American myth uh, in the place of New York. What he tries to do, he tries to transport uh, the geography, the geography, uh, uh, geography of cricket playing in his native place to New York, and he, he tries to create a perfect. Uh, um, place uh, a, a, a perfect cricket field in New York, although he fails to do that. And uh, we can see that uh, 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 Joseph O'Neill uh, tells us another story of um, the failure of the American dream. But uh, still, there is this idea uh, uh, in which uh, New York turns out uh, it, it's a, a place that is transformed by the migrants. And uh, the migrants become visible in this place. So uh, I try to see the different modes, the different versions of the city that uh, uh, get out of uh, these different stories of migration. And uh, I continue my uh, collection of stories. Thank you for your attention. So that's briefly <laughs> about my project. Thank you very much, um, Oksana, for um, for the, this, this presentation encapsulating the this this incredibly incredibly complex research that you are that you are uh, doing here on on uh, the feelings of um, of alienation of um, of migration, um, and I couldn't help but think you know hey, here we are talking about global humanities global a feeling of a, a global uh, world. Um, and and your authors seem to seem to be forced to to leave their their habitat seem to be forced to go to to a place like new york which is which is uh, as you said transformed by a huge migration population which is there but nevertheless they they there's such a strong and 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 poignant um feeling of being alienated of of missing uh the home country although there there is the the, the memory of of the stress and the reason why they 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 had to emigrate they had to, had to leave so it's such a psychologically complex and um i would say is it is it fear is it is it because a uh, post traumatic uh feeling of fear uh in the new surroundings where they are um but I'm, I'm sort of thinking this is this is very this is this is actually um, shining some light on our global humanities project. This this feeling of alienation and of of never managing to forget the home um, habitat. The, the... Yeah, there is no straightforward answer. Yes, because it's the question of looking back or looking ahead. Uh, so the, the looking ahead uh, strategy as in Netherlands novel uh, doesn't succeed, uh, although uh, in other instances, uh, 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 this trans uh, I would say that uh, uh, this idea of transplantation of one's own place uh, is, um, is especially appealing for me because it, it is really transplanted in, in the creation of uh, communities of uh, such like in in the toponymy how many places we have in the United States that uh, bear the, the, the toponymy of uh, uh, the original places. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
uh, and uh, uh, to some extent, even the histories are uh, transplanted, uh, like uh, uh, this uh, story of New Amsterdam. Yes, that uh, oh, it is not transplanted, but it's also. Um, uh, ex exploited, for example, by the Dutch people uh, nowadays. Uh, yeah, mm, yeah, uh, that's uh, that's what is the, the for me personally is the difficulty of my research because I am trying to uh, speak about this condition of migration and it it has so many aspects. Uh, it's uh, the human condition from the very beginning of uh, uh, the human race. Uh, we can get back to Odysseus, we can back to Cain and Abel and the story, we can back, get back to many other stories, yeah, but um, in modern day situation, yes, I, uh, I tried to uh, see, diff um, yes, what, what, what uh, are the ways to adjust to uh, maybe assimilate is not a really good word to adjust and uh, to overcome, yes, that rift of transition. Mm -hmm. And a, a second, a second thought that that came to me: um, this this uh, migration, this transition, is experienced as a pain or a a, a challenge that is being embraced and that is actually uh, making you stronger and and uh, revitalizing you. Or it depends on the situation. Uh, yes, uh, uh, from the point of view of economists, migrants can be successful, and then uh, that that will mean revitalization. Uh, from the point of view, uh, 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 or uh, if uh, they fail to uh, get adjusted to the new culture, then certainly that that will be the growing pain. The situation of a and I already mentioned the modality of migration, whether it is forced, like uh, Joseph O'Neill wasn't forced to move. Yes, he is the observer who observes this uh, migrating world and uh, who observes what is happening uh, to the world filled with more and more with migrants uh, from different cultures. Um, uh, yeah, different ways. Yeah, different ways to... Uh to experience that. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody wants to? Yes, Raphael, thank you. Um, hi, um, I hope you can hear me. Thanks, Oksana. That was really, really interesting. I wanted to just ask a, a, about a theme that you picked out, which was um, history, um, uh, along so movement in time as well as space. And I just felt like, um, I, well, I'm, I'm interested in how you see the fictions of the early 21st century fitting into a history of, of New York migration, where I guess some of the stories are very positive ones of opportunity and excitement, and some of the th stories are very negative ones of conflict and exclusion and so on. And I'm and and yet every story is a new one. So I'm I'm yes. interested in where the where the where the burden of history is is felt by um, uh, particular writers or particular characters. Um, it seems like an important aspect of of, of New York specifically? Mm, I would say that uh, mm, they rather tend to uh, uh, reconsider the history, not depend on the history, but uh, uh, see it uh, from the new point of view, from the point of view of, uh, 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 of this colonial world, for example, the colonial world that migrates here. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, yes, uh, the history that uh, lies behind, because uh, quite quite often uh, the history of violence, which is uh, recovered nowadays, uh, has been suppressed for for uh, for so many decades. So, and they try to recover probably the, the history of violent violence and domination. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Hans. Yes. I'm a migrant. Uh, moving here, moved here some whatever 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the last few years, uh, for me, that really meant forgetting my own history. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's, we live in a parochial England where all history is about England, really, uh, and the history of small countries is forgotten. 
so I forgot my own history too, until I did a project in the last few years where it made me go back to archives in Holland and you know, all that stuff came back. So, and I guess that leads me to, to my question to you. And it's, it's a little bit like Raphael's question. He was sort of asking about changes over time and how people deal with their own past. So I think, uh, you know, it's partly something in the zeitgeist, that's something in their own life story. You know, the older people will return to their own past more easily. I think that's a pattern. But I also think there's, I was just wondering really if there's not something specific to New York here because New York has always hung on to its local regional identities, right? You have Italian mm -hmm. communities, your Irish communities, your Dutch communities. It has always been never a melting pot, but always a divided city that mm -hmm. has worked hard at keeping its divisions. And I'm not sure that other cities are like that. Like San Francisco really isn't, nor is Amsterdam, as far as I can tell, uh, nor is, you know, I think many places in Europe are similar. So I was wondering if that is not something to do with the author, the individual, etc. but it is something that New York, should, should we not give New York as a city some agency in this process? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that's a, an interesting question that I would uh, like to think more over, but um, uh, what I'm trying to see also the places, uh, not the places that much that belong to communities, I mean, uh, geographically in, in terms of space, but the central uh, places which um, uh, became the part of uh, the myth and the image of New York and how they are reconsidered. Uh, yeah, probably, uh, yeah, I have to take into account that, but uh, uh, that's good that you mentioned that uh, uh, migration also um, uh, provokes this uh, uh, return to one's past. Like Vasil Mahno, I, uh, I have to mention him. Uh, his fir uh, first, uh, one of the first uh, collections in this new space was uh, the poems of New York, but it, about a decade later, he starts writing um, essays and uh, novel about Ukraine and the history of Ukraine. So he tries to reconsider his part. That exactly, that's what you are saying. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Oksana. Anyone else has a, a question or a comment? But... Uh, no, it's a it's a fascinating research, and and I can see that um, uh, interesting interesting um, angles uh, are coming from from yeah all across all across uh, the, the the writings that you are that you're analyzing. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, and I see that uh, Vincenzo, you've uh, joined us. I hope the move goes well and you didn't break your back or anything uh, carrying uh, boxes but I'm, no, but I'm surrounded by unopened boxes now yeah, so. <laughs> yeah that's uh and that uh, would be like this for a few days i'm afraid the, oh definitely oh, <laughs> at least a few days but so we can we can go to the last uh, the last pair of um um participants to our to our workshop so um, Professor Vincenzo Vergiani is um, Professor of Sanskrit in the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. His research centers on the history of linguistic ideas and the philosophy of language in ancient India from the late first millennium to the early second millennium of the common era. And with, with him, we will hear Dr. Vinod uh, Murali. Dr. Murali received his PhD at the, you have to tell us, SCSVMV University in Tamil Nadu in India. Um, he's a research associate in Professor Vergiani's research project called An Intellectual History of Late Vedanta. And Dr. Murali's research topic is Sanskrit grammar, literature, and Alam Kara Shastra, Poetics, Vedanta, and Jyotisha, Astrology. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Just, I prepared a 
of course, a small, some slight 2%. Is it visible to you all? Hello? Yes, it's visible. Thank you. Namaste, one and all. Yeah, this is Vinod from India. And I joined the FIMS as a postdoc in the project An Intellectual History of Late Vedanta. And thanks to Madam for introducing me to the people present here. And yeah, as she said, uh, all those are my expertise field like literature, uh, Sanskrit literature, linguistics, grammar, Jyoti Shah Vedanta. But among them, considering the time limit, I would just like to present on the current project which connects me with the faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies here in Cambridge. So we were doing some research projects. We, in the sense like myself, I was doing some individual research projects that are mentioned on the posters, uh, sorry, on the poster and French Research Institute, which is located in Pondicherry, a territory in India. And I, there were some other individual research projects taking place in FAMES. But this particular thematic area, that is the School of Indian Philosophy, which we call as Vedanta, connected both uh, the Indian researcher and the faculty uh, of the University of Cambridge together. So if it is asked why and how I choose this, institute or this particular faculty to proceed further or to join hands for my research work. It's three things. First of all, while doing my research in India, we were expecting, of course, whenever I say we, that's myself, I, okay. We were expecting an international collaborations with reputed European universities, which produces qualitative research works. And by that time, I come to hear about the reading sessions um, organized by the team before uh, before I joined the uh, team. They organized some reading sessions, which are open to all Sanskrit scholars worldwide. And I participated in the reading session, not only by the activity, but also by the inspiration that I got from the theme of the project that is an intellectual history of late Vedanta. So the theme inspired me a lot and I thought of joining hands with this faculty members. So I was just waiting for that. And I came to know that there is a position for a research associate in the project. Of course, I applied and I was interviewed and I got selected and started working with these people um, from September, 2020, that is last year. So this is how an Indian researcher came to Cambridge as a postdoc. So what we do, what is this Vedanta? Vedanta is uh, one among the many philosophical theologies of India. So there are other philosophical theologies like uh, uh, Nyaya, which is translated as uh, logic theory and Vaisheshika, atomic theory, like that. So among them, Vedanta is more connected with the culture as well as heritage of the country, that is India. So uh, being a foremost school of Indian philosophical theology, Vedanta investigates the characteristics of Brahman, what we call Brahman in Sanskrit, which is none other than the supreme soul, uh, that are explained in the Vedic texts, which are the source for our uh, Vedanta principles, the principles of the uh, philosophical theology. So based on the theories, uh, as well as uh, the interpretations of the theories, there exist many sub-schools in Vedanta, which we call in Sanskrit as Advaita, Vishishta Advaita, Advaita, which can be translated as non-dualism, dualism, attributive dualism, etc. Among them, considering the project timeline, we are focusing on pure non-dualism, which we call in Sanskrit as Advaita Vedanta. So this project that is this intellectual history of late Vedanta investigates the intellectual history of 
Advaita Vedanta for the period like 150 years, that is 1750 to 1900. In other words, the later 18th century and sorry, 17th, uh, 18th century and 19th century. Sorry. So if it is asked why we choose this particular period, the reason behind choosing this particular period, though there exists number of reasons, we I would like to tell you that there are three major reasons. One is during this particular period, Sanskrit scholars produced many polemical works, not only to defend their own relation, which I said a little bit earlier, that is non-dualism theory, dualism, etc. So not only to defend their own tradition, but also to refute other traditions. So there were, uh, high, there, we can see a high production of polemical works in this particular period. This is the first reason for choosing this particular period. And second thing, through the compositions, through their text, they exchanged many innovative philosophical ideas in a different way. Also, they used new methods to defend their theory as well as to refute the opponent. So this became the major reason for us to choose this topic, if I'm not wrong. So this is how uh, our project uh, focuses on this pure non-dualism, the period 1715 to 1900, which we call as an intellectual history of late Vedanta. So this is the project team. So this, of course, you all know, this project is led by Professor Vincent Zhu as the principal investigator, uh, and Dr. Jonathan, who is also present here, uh, being a main researcher, his outcome is expected as the uh, major output of this project uh, that I will explain a little bit uh, later in this presentation. And Ankur, Dr. Ankur from the Faculty of Divinity has also joined our team. And two other researchers, include from India joined this team. That is one is Dr. Hugo David, who is a former postdoc of Cambridge University, who works uh, in EFEO, that is uh, Ecole Francaise Extreme de Orient. Uh, it is a French research institute located, another French research institute that differs from the French research institute where I'm working. So it is another French research institute, which is located in Pondicherry territory in India. And the final one is none other than me, you know. So this is our project team. So what we do as well as what I do, what we do in this project together and what I do individually and how we do together and how I do individually, if it is asked, we are... Uh, so we are uh, doing some activities in four axes. On the, on the first axis, we construct a database, detailed database of the scholars belonging to our period, especially the Advaita scholars, the scholars belongs, belong to the non-dualism school. Um, so we create a database of the scholars and the works composed by them. To be more precise, we collect the details of the authors and the works of Advaita belonging to the south part of India, the south states, uh, southern state of India that is mentioned here. And we feed it in an Excel sheet. And thanks to Dr. Jonathan, who uh, gave us a template uh, uh, in which we are now, which we are using actually, which I myself using for my uh, work. Of course, uh, being uh, though I'm be I belong to Tamil Nadu, I focus on Karnataka because uh, Jonathan has taken Tamil Nadu and earlier one scholar from India was hired for one year and he gave us the details of the scholars and the works from Andhra Pradesh. Now I focus on Karnataka. I collect the names of the scholars and their works. Uh, based on this, in the second axis, we collect unpublished manuscripts of those authors. That is, again, belonging to our period, that is 1715 to 1900. We collect those unpublished works uh, in Advaita Vedanta, that is non-dualism. Also, we inspect them. 
uh, we collect them from different uh, you know, library sources, notably from British Library and our central library, and we collect them, we inspect them. Uh, sometimes we study them as well as we transliterate them. This, is, this also serves uh, a reason for selecting me, if I'm not wrong, because all many of this, probably most of the manuscripts as well as most of the rare publications are published in or written in Grantha script, a script, an ancient Indian script, which is used to write on manuscripts in those days. So I, I, I can read Grantha script, I can write Grantha script, and I can study them. And I know some South Indian languages. So as the project is more focused on the southern port of India, as I'm good in the South languages, as well as the Grantha script, I think this became uh, one reason for selecting me, if I'm not wrong. So in the second axis, based on the first, that is the database, we collect and inspect the unpublished works or unnoticed works of the authors. And in the third stage, which means the third activity, what we do is we identify some key figures. Either it could be a particular scholar or a teacher under whom many scholars have read, but they had different opinions among them. Even though the scholar or the teacher belong to a particular tradition in non-dualism, they may differ in interpreting uh, interpreting, or uh, they may differ in explaining the theory. Uh, they may differ from the earlier scholar. So we identify those key figures, either it could be some teachers or some scholars belonging to our period. Also, we identify the centers of learning. For example, a particular state or a particular city in southern part of India might have acted, not might have actually acted as a center for learning uh, in which many scholars studied together, but when they came out, when they started composing their works, they differed. They differed, uh, as I said, they differed uh, in explaining their uh, theories. They differed in explaining uh, the interpretations of the basic text, something like that. So we identify the centers. Sometimes some traditional schools belonging to a particular religious uh, institutions acted as a center of learning. We study about them. We try to trace the history of that because not only the center, because it, it, it didn't act as only, it didn't act only as center of learning, but also a place for discussion, which sometimes turned as debate. So this helped us to find out some fascinating topics that created innovative philosophical ideas which resembled or which is represented by the scholars on the text. So in the final axis, we study them. This study is, uh, is text, this study takes place in two different uh, steps. One is, uh, as I said earlier, which, uh, uh, which helped me to come here, that is the reading sessions, which is organized once in every two weeks led by Dr. Jonathan. The interesting thing in the reading session is two things. One is we read unnoticed or unstudied Advaita texts and we discuss them. And uh, second thing is uh, this reading session involves also scholars from other region, not only means beyond the project team, it involves the scholars globally. For example, a scholar from Vienna University and a scholar from Japan and a few scholars from India eagerly participating in this reading sessions. And it is open, we welcome actually, we welcome uh, the scholars out of this project team to read such texts that are unnoticed. And that has become some branch, that uh, expresses some interesting uh, themes. And after that, we choose particular uh, topics that has become a uh, subject for the debate among the scholars. 
which led them to write these polemical things and exchange some innovative philosophical ideas using new methods. So we select those topics and we study about them. So after all this, if it is asked, what will be the objective of this project and what we achieved and what I achieved so far or what is going to be achieved at the end of the project. So I would like to just categorize into two different ways. One is so far we achieved and what we are planned for the next, means for the upcoming period. So far we collected more than 50 plus rare publications uh, of course, it is uh, the numbers are just af after I joined the um, team. But before my arrival, I'm sure and I know that uh, the team has collected more than the rare publications and unpublished manuscripts from British Library. So we translated some texts and we also delivered some talks related to our project. Uh, a few months ago, Dr. Jonathan has presented a talk uh, in the World Sanskrit Conference on a topic which is closely related to our uh, project team. And of course, in another two days, I'm going to present a uh, paper in uh, the symposium, uh, which is going to be held on 2nd June at the Oxford University on a topic that is very much related to what I'm doing right now. That is the influence of grammar in this, which is my expertise field. So. On the other hand, what is planned for the upcoming period? If it is us, then we would say that there are two more field works left for us. Uh, one is by Dr. Jonathan, who will be visiting the southern port, the Tamil Nadu, and myself, I will be visiting Karnataka, another southern state uh, in um, India. We plan to interact with the descendants of the scholars flourished in our period. It, we, we are sure that will be like... Uh, interesting and that will give us more information for our project. And uh, I would like to extend uh, the article which I am going to present uh, in the symposium at Oxford. And I would like to ad make an advanced version of it. And I would like to present, a, publish it in a reputed European journal with the help of my project team, which will be a contribution from my side uh, for this project. And the major output of this project is the monograph that is under preparation by Dr. Jonathan, which is intended to publish by the end of 2024 or the early 2025, in other words, the end of the project time. So this is what, what we do, how we do. And to conclude, if it is asked, because I was just pointed out, I, I was just told that uh, how to sustain the link. If it is because my tenure gets completed, by the by the month of August next year, that is 2024. So, do I have any intention to uh, sustain the link, or do we, are we planning to sustain the collaborative research works? If it is us, yes, we discussed a lot about this, and uh, we discussed a lot about this, so that uh, we come to a conclusion to sustain the links in three different ways. Of course, it needs a big work, but the first one is doing some collaborative research programs like the one which we are doing. Uh, in this context, I would just like to highlight that, uh, I think Jonathan won't mind, a intent to submit a proposal to EZR, uh, sorry, e ERC, sorry, sorry, sorry for that, ERC, uh, to study the flourishing intellectual history of the Kaveri Delta again uh, between the 17th and 19th century that involves Sanskrit literature. Now we are doing in Vedanta, that is a philosophy, and it is intended to do some collaborative research programs in Sanskrit literature. Also, we are planning to organize some joint activities like organizing some uh, seminars, conferences, um, Depending upon the funds, sometimes it will be uh, organized offline, either in India or here, uh, sometimes online. And apart from that, we are also planning to uh, organize some scholar visits, uh, either a scholar from Cambridge may be invited to our institution um, for a week or for 10 days to do some joint activities, 
or a scholar from India will be invited here to do the same thing. In this context, I would like to say even in this project that is an intellectual issue of late Vedanta, we invited a scholar from India in February, uh, a professor from IIT Bombay who delivered uh, talks on special topics uh, in which uh, graduate students, um, some other uh, faculty members and general public took part and it was well received. So we plan to extend it in the upcoming years. And the final one, which needs a big work, which needs a big teamwork, not only with the researchers, but also uh, from the side of the administrative as administration that is working on the possibilities to look for the, to offer courses and a joint venture between uh, the faculty and the research institute that acts in India. So that's it. Uh, this is what we do, how we do, and especially what I do. I focus on a Karnataka, re Karnataka region. I collect the database of the authors. I study the manuscripts. I study the book. Uh, there are publications that are published in Grantha scripts. And we discuss about the fascinating topics. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Vinod, for that um, that that fantastic uh, presentation. Um, I can see how your uh, how your input input is really essential for the for the project that uh, Vincenzo um, has uh, Vincenzo and Jonathan had um, have put together. And uh, I'm particularly I'm particularly delighted to see the last slide where you're really looking looking ahead and um, coming with ideas of further collaboration. That is very much I think what um, what the Global Humanities Initiative is trying to put to put in place as well. And so um, you know that might be also maybe maybe not um, a possibility for. Um, for um, global humanities initiative in Cambridge to um, to help or to to um, accompany what uh, what you want to do in uh, in the future. Who knows? Who knows? But mm -hmm. um, I um, I give the floor to Vincenzo. You would uh, also you you had also planned to say a few things about um, this collaboration, Vincenzo. Well, uh, one thing I wanted to say about the project, which I think is makes it particularly valuable is that um, uh, we focus on a period of Indian intellectual history which coincides, I mean begins roughly with the beginning, the beginning of the colonial era and the, possibly the most famous Indologist uh, in the world, the one who's known beyond the boundaries of our discipline, um, Sheldon Pollock, has argued at some point that has coined the very um, evocative phrase, death of Sanskrit, saying that basically the beginning of the common era coincided with the end of uh, traditional Sanskritic culture. Now, um, in fact, what, what we try to uh, show through our project is that um, of course, uh, a whole complex uh, literary culture doesn't die overnight or even over a few decades. Uh, while uh, the um, modern educational institutions imported or created according to the Western model were, were being created by mainly the, the British Raj, um, the traditional institution survived and in a, and thrived even. Uh, and to some extent the two the path, the two paths um, intersected. So um, and what I've been trying to argue in the past in uh, public discussions here in Cambridge is that um, well, First of all, India doesn't enter history when the Europeans arrive in the 16th century, uh, even less so when the British arrive uh, later than other uh, Westerners. 
And uh, you can't really understand what happens in the early modern and the modern period in, in a continent, in a, in a region that's uh, rightly called the subcontinent because it's vast and varied as a, as a continent without looking at, at its history, at its pre-modern history, at the pre-modern period. Um, just to make an example, and that's something that connects to with, with what you do, Christine. Uh, the medieval period was marked by uh, the, the presence of Muslim polities that were, of course, connected with uh, West Asia, Iran. Uh, the Mughals are the most famous among them. And uh, this is an area that uh, it would be very much worth exploring and expanding in the future. Um, but there is a continuity from the medieval period to the modern period, which um, we try to uh, draw attention to with the project. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo. Thank you very much um, for, for this, this commentary and, and putting the, the project in, in, uh, in a context of, uh, of existing research and, and of, uh, of historical um, um, ideas and, and uh, realities. I don't know, Jonathan, if, if uh, you would like to add something or not. Um, we have... Well, I could just uh, clarify and add to what has been said. I mean, the summary of Vinod was excellent. And by the way, Vinod is, uh, is the best. I mean, there were five candidates interviewed, and he's, if I can attest that he's, uh, he's really the best. Uh, he's an excellent colleague, and uh, he's bringing a very rare expertise in manuscript studies. As you said, we, we looked at uh, several manuscripts and rare printed publications. And what's interesting is that uh, those publications coming from South India uh, don't use the Nagari script that we all, I mean, that we're all familiar with. So um, that people tattoo on themselves, like the Sanskrit words are normally in the Nagari script, but most of the words we look at are in uh, Southern scripts, so Granta scripts, Telugu scripts, um, and so on. So uh, before we know, we had another researcher I should mention, he briefly said, uh, who worked one year for the project uh, remotely during the COVID period, and he was specializing in the, Reading Telugu script. Uh, yeah, so, and uh, yeah, Vinod is bringing a, a, an amazing expertise in terms of uh, simply translating as well those texts. He's a, a fluent uh, uh, speaker of Sanskrit. Uh, so that's, that's about Vinod and uh, following up on what uh, Vincenzo said. So, yes, the, uh, the, the broader sort of argument behind the project as we envisaged it at the beginning was to counteract this very dominant narrative in our entire field uh, to the effect that, uh, there, that there's a death of Sanskrit after 1750, Sanskritic culture. So there's this argument, there's a peak between 1550 uh, uh, during the Mughal period actually uh, in India, uh, 16th, 17th uh, century, 17th century, there's a peak and then there's a decline. The problem with the argument is that uh, the publications are not out there. So we don't have uh, a printed editions of the works that were composed after the 18th century. So we cannot really assess the dynamism of the period without actually uncovering this material going uh, to India. And I was amazed by the number of sources unexplored at the British Library actually. So just taking all this material and reading them, then we can assess uh, if it's true, looking at even just one particular school. And I can say that, uh, in fact, I think the argument we're making, which is some sort of pioneering argument, is that it's, it's, it's false. It's wrong to claim that after 1750, there's a decline. Yes, after 1900, there is a decline, for sure. But between 1750 and 1900, it's still flourishing. Um, and then we could go on, on, on questions of, uh, of modernities. What, is, there, is there a modernity in India at that time? What shape it takes or so forth? So this is an argument I'm trying to make in the forthcoming monograph. Um, and this is just about one school. And the argument can certainly be extended to poetry, poetics, logic, and all sorts of disciplines in India. So um, I think the project is doing something great uh, for India. And one thing about it is that we involve the, the researchers from there that 
in our reading sessions, we have pundits, uh, we have real pundits, we have sometimes like descendants of these pundits we're studying, reading with us. It's a very, very nice, uh, uh, organically, uh, very nice project. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I don't know if there is any further question to Vinod, Jensu, or Jonathan. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a fascinating uh, presentation. I just uh, was curious about the, the, the element of the project that's identifying kind of schools and centers of learning. And um, uh, this seems, seems to sort of have a, a kind of a sedentary uh, model of, of knowledge production. And I was wondering, picking up on the theme of modernity, were the scholars mobile? And to what extent was there a sort of a, a, a broader sort of Sanskrit sphere or public sphere, um, which, which sort of transcended um, the, the individual locations, um, perhaps towards the end of the period as well? I mean, is, is it a sort of a picture of kind of local centers of learning kind of keeping their discussions going through this period and then dying out towards the end of it? Or is there sort of a, are they brought up sort of caught up in other processes of, of mobility and, and, and sort of um, communication. Yeah, I may try to answer about that. Paul, I'm, I'm very sorry my dog was really barking at the same time at the beginning, but I think I got what really was barking exactly at that moment. I, I mean, I, th I think I got what you, what you, what you said. It was something about mobility is uh, an important question for us. So there's the presence of, for example, um, a, a focus of interest in the project are not so much the cosmopolitan centers, the colonial centers, like the big cities. In fact, these these uh, the writers, we call them the pundits, um, were all Brahmins, so high caste. Uh, you know, only then could speak and write in Sanskrit. And what what we see statistically is that they are located along rivers, okay, for different ritual duties. They, they tend to live along the rivers, the big rivers. Uh, the Ganga would be one somewhere else, but uh, in South India, is for instance the Kaveri Delta. Uh, it's, a, it's a very rich uh, agricultural area. Um, and this is my focus of interest geographically. Um, and so they would live together in, 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 in you know, pockets, different villages. And, and we were not very clear, you know, uh, are they interacting with one another? And it seems that, yes, so it seems that some, some villages were used as uh, centers of learning. So you would have students from other teachers somewhere else, they would be sent to uh, study with the great, you know, the greater pundits. Uh, and then we also notice by looking at uh, the exchange, the polemical exchanges between the works that um, especially at the end of the 19th century, the, the, uh, with the printing press, um, of course, um, and, and we don't have manuscripts anymore. We start to have pamphlets, so little books, and that uh, enhanced the circulation very quickly. So uh, you could have a, a book written in, in in one year, and the next year you have a reply from maybe you know 200 miles. Um, so there was circulation quickly of texts. There was also uh, people going to what we call sabha, so basically uh, 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 debates. There was a, a scene of debates, if you wish. So that that's something very old in India that is still going on. People would just debate publicly, public debates. Uh, so they would move, they would travel, and they would debate, and sometimes record this, those debates in the form of words. Uh, so yes, uh, increased mobility in terms of, of movements, in terms of ideas, in, especially in this period. Okay. Well, I think I think this is uh, this is it. Um, so thank you so much, Oksana, Vinod, um, Paul, and uh, Egdunas. Um, and um, who am I forgetting? Um, Frisbee and uh, Stephen for uh, joining us. I think it was a very interesting and multi multidisciplinary um, within the School of Arts and Humanities, but uh, a very a very uh, dynamic and energizing workshop. So thank you very much for joining um, and. Um, There'll be, I hope, more more opportunities in the future to to uh, talk together and to and to discuss our research. Thank you and bye bye. Thank, Thank you, you Steve, for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 bye.